Welcome um, to today, today's uh, Michigan Engineering DEI lecture. I'm Ann Jeffers. I'm an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering. These DEI lectures are an important element of our people first engineering and our launch of DEI 2.0. We appreciate you being part of the learning and growing together as a community. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's DEI lecture. Emily Obert is the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Experience Design Director at Ford Motor Company. In this role, she ensures that human-centered design at Ford includes groups who have been historically marginalized and are underserved by present products. Emily holds both a BS and an MS in mechanical engineering from MIT and is currently pursuing an MBA at University of Michigan Ross School of Business. Please welcome Emily Obert. I was an automotive engineer working on a climate control system for a new autonomous vehicle. And I was seeing the prototype of the vehicle for the first time. It was a combination of wood, metal and plastic with upholstered seats meant to give a feel for the dimensions of the vehicle and what it would be like to ride inside. The only problem was I couldn't get into it. Suddenly, I was no longer surrounded by fluorescent lights or the murmur of my coworkers. I was transported to February the year before when I was visiting friends in San Francisco. And at a Burmese restaurant, my husband and I were wrapping up dinner. We ordered an Uber and left the glow of the restaurant with the delicious aroma and the hum of lively conversation cut off as we stepped out onto the sidewalk and the door swung shut behind us. A cold fog had set in, so thick it was like rain. The sidewalk was wet and slick and the sounds of traffic were muted by the heavy blanket covering the city. My husband and I huddled together for warmth. Hunched over, we watched the icon of our Uber creep closer. The blue light of the screen harsh in the dark night. We looked up and saw our Uber coming towards us. It was slowing down, but as we moved towards the car, it accelerated and drove off. A notification popped up. Our ride was canceled. What? That was weird. We ordered another Uber. I rubbed my hands together for warmth. At last, our ride was arriving. As it approached, the window rolled down. The driver leaned over and yelled, no wheelchairs, and went speeding off. Wow, did, did that just happen? My throat tightened up and a wave of heat moved down my spine. In a flash, the heat was gone and all that was left was my dismay and indignation. I was being left on the curb. At this point, the fog had soaked into my coat the cold had seeped into my bones. I shivered. What do we do? What, what do we do? What do we do? We devised the plan. My husband was going to call a third Uber and I was going to hide. I moved around the corner and shrunk into the shadows. As small as I made myself, I felt even smaller. My anger and disappointment felt like an icy knot inside of me. I have to hide from my ride. Maybe Uber wasn't for me. The fluorescent light above me flickered and I was back in the office. This again, this vehicle isn't for me either. The icy knot in my stomach clenched. Maybe we weren't yelling, no wheelchairs, but our design was essentially doing 
the same thing as the driver on that wet night back in February. We were leaving people on the curb. Okay, Emily, stay cool, be prof professional, take a breath. I turned to the head of the program. I can't get into this vehicle. Yeah, it's pretty high, he hedged. What did you think when you got into it? The manager looked sheepish. Actually, I have a bad back and can't get into the vehicle either. At that moment, we realized this is so much bigger than just the two of us. In fact, this is bigger than just one prototype or just one industry. The world is full of products, infrastructure, and even policy that regularly leaves people on the curb. I don't know about you, but I want people to feel joy and feel like the product was designed for them. And when they interact with the things that I've designed, we can design a more inclusive and more just future. And let me spend the next 25 minutes sharing some principles with you that can help. So let me share my screen so you can see the slides. So the principles I'm going to share, I didn't create them, but I think they're great. And I think they address a lot of the problems that I see um, in the industry. So if you want to check this out, um, the Design Justice Network, there's a link there. Uh, it's pretty short, but the slides will also be, be shared out. So um, these are created back in 2018, and I think they're still incredibly relevant today. Um, so here we go. There's 10 of them. So, okay. So the first one, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. And I think if you think back to the opening story, for me, working on making autonomous vehicles more accessible was a healing process and a way of dealing with the indignation and dismay of being left on the curb by two Uber drivers. And I was uh, talking to my husband about this presentation and he reminded me that we did um, reach out to customer service after that happened and they gave us a refund of $3. So like that, <laughs> I was rubbing salt in the wound there. And um, then when, you know, I, I it was about a year later when we were working on autonomous vehicles um, at Ford and uh, it really just brought me back. And so access to transportation is tied to economic opportunity and being able to participate in community life, including our government and sustaining the um, our communities is really uh, intertwined with um, working on accessibility for me. And I, you know, it doesn't have to be accessibility. I think we have tons of different um, communities who are uh, oppressed in different ways. And so, um, and they, and they intersect as well. So I'll use lots of um, examples from my life, but I think there's, hopefully you'll be able to see how these principles apply um, more broadly. So the, the second principle is centering the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. And so what this, um, what this can look like when it goes wrong is um, back in May 2020, if you remember, middle of the pandemic or the kind of the peak of the beginning of the pandemic. And really the only things you could do were like walking around outside. Um, and the town where I live is a little uh, town called Ferndale, just north of Detroit. And 
Woodward Avenue, which is like a, a like a surface highway with four lanes, north and south, and it cuts right through the heart of downtown. And we have a crosswalk um, that has like a little median, but you really don't want to get stuck on the median because then there's like smelly traffic zooming by on either side. And it had been 60 seconds to cross for like years. And then all of a sudden in May, somebody was optimizing something from, you know, I don't know, wherever MDOT's headquarters is. And all of a sudden the traffic signal had 23 seconds to cross. And so when you think about, you know, what a, they didn't really consult the community who was directly impacted at all. And it was really disruptive to our like downtown life. Our mayor got involved. Um, there was no like easy path to resolution. There was lots of like just calling different people in like the networks of MDOT and public officials. And so um, you have to really think like who is going to be impacted by this and get them involved when making decisions. And, you know, things can be seem like a small change from like your perspective, but until you really consult with the people directly impacted or get, you know, collaborate, you'll see later on, it's not really consulting that we're going for here, um, that we will uh, have more success. So number three, we prioritize the design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. So um, kind of, if you don't realize this, uh, there, there's a little picture here um, that says RIP ego on a tombstone. And um, the designer's in, uh, intentions, they, they really don't matter. So I mean, my feelings as a designer often have to get set aside. And I have an example from work um, where there was an EV uh, 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 electric autonomous vehicle, and it was a pilot program operating in Southwest Detroit to uh, food from a food pantry to an over 65 community. Um, and in Southwest Detroit, there are a lot of people that speak Spanish. Um, and so the shuttle had language on it saying um, that it was an autonomous vehicle, both in English um, and Spanish. And it mentioned that it was uh, a research vehicle. And the way it was translated um, was while accurate, we had you know someone who was bilingual from the communications team um, provide the translation. But when I met with our community partners, they let me know you know this language is too technical. It's kind of giving the wrong impression. And um, going back to our comms team, they said, well, it's accurate. It's correct. And their intention, you know, was they felt like carried out, but it doesn't really matter, you know, what I thought or what our comms team thought, what really matters is the community's feelings. And so um, if, you know, given the chance to do that pilot again, I would definitely want to consult with the community first to understand the language before, um, you know, getting the, the wrap or the kind of like the stickers for the side of the vehicle. Four, uh, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process rather than the destination, the point at the end. And I think I mentioned, you know, a lot of us want to have positive impact, but the positive impact, the way we get there is through that accountable process that people can participate in. That's collaborative. And I have an example here. So this picture is a sketch of a skate park in Ferndale with a, a girl on a scooter and a, a skateboarder catching air. Um, 
I, for many years, was the, a volunteer with the city of Ferndale leading the Parks and Rec uh, Commission. And so I um, chaired many public meetings as part of that role. And we had seen in our master land use plan that people wanted a skate park. We got a lot of feedback from residents about that. And so um, the to deliver what we the what the residents wanted, we first had to choose a park for this. So Ferndale has a lot of parks. Um, and so which one should have the skate park was the first question. And then initially we thought, oh, we're gonna put this in in the, a park on the east side. And then as we started um, holding meetings, everyone on the east side, they, they did not really want the skate park. And we had a lot of voices coming out uh, against it. But then on the west side, we had a lot of families saying, we really want the skate park near us. Please build this near our house. And we had a lot of consensus um, that the skate park should be on the west side. And so the only way we really figured that out was by making sure that we were engaging in that community process, that we are having meetings at times when people could get to them accessible and that um, we weren't coming in with our, we were willing to change. You know, we came in with a, just a hypothesis that the park should be uh, on the east side and we found out we were wrong. And so you have to, you know, hold your ideas lightly and really engage in the process um, to achieve the outcome. And I think this is one of my favorite quotes. It's um, from some Aboriginal activist in Queensland, Australia. And it reads, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you see your liberation as bound up with mine, let us work together. And so I think what the reason why I want to share this here is because um, I think sometimes people see like, oh, I want to help someone. I want to make a difference. And you do this design project, this engineering project, and you, it's like you're giving a gift and it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because you have to work together and you have to see yourself more like a part of a, a team right and you if you don't engage with this pro with the process then it's kind of like the savior mindset and it it's it's not going to um have the impact that uh, we often hope for principle five we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert so many of us engineers, we come to our discipline because we love technology. And many of us even go on to become an expert in a specific area. Um, but because of this enthusiasm, we can often get a little ahead of ourselves in solving a problem that doesn't really exist or where we don't really understand and prescribing a solution that looks great to us, um, but it doesn't actually lead to the ultimate impact that we are hoping for. And so you want to commit to the, the process like we were just talking about, number four. Um, and here I'm gonna stick to the skate park example. So once we got the, the location, we had a design build firm, they had experts, they, you know, had CAD tools, they knew about all the proper slopes and how to pour the concrete. Um, but instead of just having them go off and design something, we took the role of a facilitator and had public meetings. We encouraged children to come. Often their voices aren't included in public discourse. And we used the expertise to know what questions to ask, to understand what tensions there were. Did we want street style elements? Did we want big bowls? Um, 
like what is what are people interested in and so it was through that facilitation knowing the questions to ask making sure that we brought people to the meetings and publicized the meetings on the right channels um that we could design the skate park together and so um it's not that uh you're relying on the community to design it for you because that expertise is important in resolving some of those tensions and conflicts and and multiple needs and reconciling all of that but the important part is kind of seeing your role as a facilitator of those needs and of meeting those needs rather than kind of top-down design. Principle six is that we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to the design process. And I think one thing I see a lot, especially with uh, the disability community, is that people will turn to perceived experts, uh, especially physicians, um, instead of turning to people with disabilities themselves. And unless the physician has a, a disability um, related to whatever they're kind of an expert in, um, they can't give you feedback on what the day-to-day -day experience is really like. And so while I think it's fine to consult experts that uh, be experts uh, that are uh, the people who are more typically recognized as experts, like doctors, you have have to recognize that people that have lived experience are experts too. And I would encourage you to turn to them first. And then if there's something you don't understand, some facts, something very specific, technical information, um, like if you're thinking about designing something for people with like hearing loss who are hard of hearing, and you've talked to a bunch of people, but you're not sure like what decibel level would meet their needs then you can bring some of that information um, to someone who might be able to help more with that kind of specific information. And I, I think one other thing is a lot of you are probably either recognized as an expert already or you will be soon. Um, and when people come to you, you can always ask the question, hey, have you talked to um, anyone with a disability or have you talked to any, um, you know, children about this or any of the uh, adults over 65, whoever that audience is, you can encourage um, folks to talk to them first and then come to you later. You can also help make that connection. Like if you know there's a person or an organization that could help, um, that they could reach out to, you can always help facilitate that connection as well. Okay, seven, we share design knowledge and tools with our communities. Uh, as engineers and designers, we have tons of tools that we've learned to use uh, from programming languages to 3D CAD software, to molecule models and on and on. Um, we've also learned helpful rules of thumb and design principles. Um, and really, this is a privilege, and we've invested, you know, a lot of time in our our education. But um, a big part of this is being more generous with this information um, and with these tools. So if you can teach, teach, teach people how to use the tools. Um, if you know, you're not comfortable teaching or it doesn't seem like something that people are interested in learning, um, then use the tools on behalf of the community. Um, and then 
if you're building a tool, make it open source, make it accessible, try to make it usable for the most novice person possible. And if during the course of a project, you aggregate knowledge, share that back to the community. And this is a, this principle is a, a way to share power. Um, and it's a big part of, um, of that justice, that part of design justice. And I think, you know, for some of, um, some of the projects where we've been working with community partners, then we might do a survey to and collect some data and we would always, you know, share that back to the, the community partner um, as, as part of that. Okay, eight, we work towards sustainable, community-led and community-controlled outcomes. This one is incredibly um, important because if you don't do this, that leads to exploitation. Um, and really undermines um, any like progress you're trying to make. And this picture is from a project in Toronto that was never built. It um, is on the waterfront. It was going to be a partnership with um, a subsidiary of Google called Sidewalk Labs. And the reason it was the concept for the project was they're going to build this multi-block development. There is going to be like sensors and data collection everywhere. And um, first off, it was not community led. It was Google led. And second of all, the data was not going to be available to the community or controlled by the community. So all of a sudden, you know, people were like, this is like a $1.3 billion like wealth extraction data, you know, is part of our um, wealth. We know it has a lot of value. And people said, no, we don't want this. And the project was abandoned. So I think this is an example of it going really poorly. Um, but this is, this is so important. And I think it can be really challenging, especially when we talk about corporations or big universities, a lot of times community controlled outcomes, that means like relinquishing um, some of your project to, to community members, um, which if they've been involved the whole time, might not be so scary, but when we're kind of missing some of those other principles, then we start to have a lot of difficulty with this one. So the, the principles really work together well. Um, but I'm not saying it's easy, but it's really important. Number nine, we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and each other. Um, this is a picture of a creek um, near my office building. And so way back, I think pre-1950, um, they piped the creek underground and um, then built like offices and roads on top. And in the new land development, they decided to bring the creek back to the surface and to create a sense of connection between um, the office and the new nature, re restoring the wetland. Um, and it really, you know, it's, this is a small change, but it, it's just a, an example of how we can reconnect to the earth through design. Um, and I think it's really important to, to recognize that non-exploitative solutions are ones where one group of person isn't taking advantage of another, um, isn't taking advantage of the, of the earth um, and using, you know, an outsized amount of resources um, or causing harm to another person or group um, or the planet. And I think, you know, there's a, a challenge here around this connection to each other 
of independence and interdependence and like how those can be intentions sometimes. And so I just wanted to recommend that if that's something you want to explore more, there's a book called Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice by Leah Lakshmi. I'm going to not get the, her, the rest of their last name quite right, but Pip Zena Sama Sinha. And um, so, yeah, definitely check out Care Work for some examples of um, care circles and um, it really explores this idea of like connection and um, non-exploitative solutions. Okay, and here we are, last principle. So before seeking new design solutions, we look for what is already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional indigenous and local knowledge and practices. And I can't emphasize this enough because I think sometimes, especially when we're young students, we get really excited about a project and we jump right in without figuring out like what's already going on. And there's um, an example that I heard um, that, you know, people are kind of like obsessed with adding LIDAR to white canes for people who are low vision or blind. And um, that the, the white cane is kind of working as is because it's not precious. It can get lost and it's not a big deal to replace. Uh, they get beat up, they get left places. And so because people will just jump to solutions without understanding what's already working, um, it really limits the impact that can be had. And you don't find out things like people prefer like the technology in their embedded in their cell phone rather than onto their cane and things like that. So um, I think there's a great segue to this concept of disability dongle. So this is a term coined by Liz Jackson. It's a, a well-intentioned, elegant yet useless solution to a problem we never knew we had. Um, Liz goes on to say that disability dongles are most often conceived and, of and created in design schools and at IDEO. So she's satirizing an outcome in which design or technologies for disabled people get a lot of mainstream attention and they get a press release, maybe something um, written up in a magazine or on the news. And the person or organization gets lots of accolades despite value concerns that people have about them. This picture is a, is a wheelchair that can climb up stairs. Um, I'm a wheelchair user. This is silly. Like we already have solutions that work like buildings that have set free entrances, ramps, elevators that function. Um, like this wouldn't even get into my car, like physical activity with my manual wheelchair is like a big um, benefit for me. And so these solutions, they get so much attention, but no one really considers that broader um, system that they live in and the concerns that disabled people have about them. And Liz Jackson and um, two others wrote like a really nice blog post that goes more in depth here. And um, so you can check that out. And it's a, it's a great piece and um, definitely worth reading. And so I want to touch on kind of one last topic before we close. So there's a little bit of a shift. Inclusive design um, is a term that you hear a lot right now. And so I just wanted to kind of address it. It's design that considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. And I think it's a great goal. This definition comes from um, OCAD in Toronto, the Inclusive Design Research Center. Um, but the problem with inclusive design, uh, it doesn't really tell you how to do it. And if you don't use the kind of design justice principles, um, you can end up actually causing um, more harm than 
good because you end up uh, getting a lot of people really um, invested in something that may not ever have a serious intention of going to market. Um, or like the Nike example, they created like a hands-free shoe, but then they didn't really have, they made like a big splashy announcement, but then didn't have any um, meaningful production available for like years. And then when it did come out, it was very expensive and a lot of people couldn't afford it. So um, inclusive design, I think, has the potential to become kind of like greenwashing where companies use it to kind of enhance their brand but aren't making meaningful um, differences in people's lives. And so I just caution you that it's a great goal, but it's important to do it with intention. And I think the design justice principles um, that I shared are a great way to, to do that. And so I'll leave you with um, the, my final thought, which is we really can make a difference and we really can you know, collaborate um, better with the people around us and um, build connections and um, kind of share power in ways that really will change the world. So um, please, uh, engage on this um, and just know it's progress over perfection. So you don't have to get it perfectly 100% right the first time. It's better to take baby steps and um, get there little by little together. Thank you so much, Emily. What a wonderful presentation. Um, and I think it hits a lot on uh, what, what uh, engineers need to hear um, in terms of taking into account uh, the people that we're actually, actually designing for. Um, I, I loved the, the principles and I actually um, will probably follow up with some reading um, based on what you've talked about today. Um, so what we're gonna do is a question and answer portion of the presentation. Um, I have some questions uh, that were submitted uh, beforehand. Others feel free to chime in in the Q&A um, part of the Zoom. Uh, and submit your questions there and we'll get to as many as, as we can today. Um, so first question, um, do you have suggestions for how everyday people can promote more equitable design in our communities and in the products we use? Yeah, I mean, I think one of my favorite ways to get involved in the community is to volunteer um, especially with like local government or, uh, it, local government's cool because it's not like a nonprofit. And so, um, I think that kind of creates, um, kind of a different dynamic where you're really responsible to the, the public. And, um, so, yeah, so I love, I love volunteering for local government, but I, I think, um, there there's other ways to do it and getting involved with like local causes that are important to you um is is also a great way for an everyday person um what advice would you give to an engineer or a designer with a disability um in the industry who wants to build a career on inclusion yeah i think um so a big of uh, being able to build a career around inclusion, um, I think it helps to really understand like what the best in class like looks like out there, which companies are doing it really well. Um, and so as far as like corporate America goes, I think Disability Inn is a place where a lot of companies get together at their um, conference every year. And they actually have a, a program for college students um, where it's called uh, Next Gen Leaders. And uh, you can sign up, you can get mentorship, and then um, they usually bring like a big uh, portion of the students to the conference. So you get to meet other students with disabilities, you get 
to meet professionals with disabilities. Uh, and I think it gives you a really good sense for, for what's out there. It's, it's got a big mix of companies too. So um, no matter what engineering discipline you're in, it would, it would be good. Great. Um, we received some technical questions related to inclusive design. Um, can you uh, give the audience a sense of what the process looks like at Ford for handling the technical aspects of inclusive design? Yeah, so for me, um, a lot of times a project will start because uh, someone tells me something isn't working for them. And especially if I hear the same thing from multiple people, like I was hearing um, that the large displays were really difficult to use. AARP did like a whole piece on it. And then I had some other folks telling me about their challenges. And so like that kicked off a project for me. And so um, that I think that's kind of the root of it is that it really starts with listening um, and making yourself kind of available to people. And then um, my first kind of step is defining that like hypothesis of like, what what is the problem we're trying to solve based on what we're hearing? And then figuring out um, like, what are some of the faster ways that we could test out ideas with people who would be um, most benefit from that? So it could be, you know, older adults or people with cognitive disabilities in the, the case that I mentioned. Um, and so, and then it's really about iterating and knowing, like, nothing is precious. You just, uh, get feedback from like real people who are impacted um, by the problem and until they you know feel satisfied with like the solutions you're proposing and if you can engage with like the same people through the course of the project at least somewhat and then bring in others to get kind of like new uh perspective i feel like that works the best. It's great to have some like partners um, along the way and really like feel like you're a team together. So. Um, there's a, a question that came in through the, the Q and A um, and I wanted to ask you cause I think it's um, a unique opportunity to have you here. Um, but what advice do you have for students who are wheelchair users so that they not only survive but also thrive in engineering? Yeah. Oh, so I spent about half my educational career um, in college as a non-military user, and then the second half, so like three years, and then the other three years as a wheelchair user. And um, I felt like I was really lucky in that the the people like my lab, my the my thesis advisor for my master's and like the other students, and I, I bet this is the same in Michigan, but they're problem solvers. So sometimes, you know, it was just a matter of saying like, hey, this is like an issue um, and kind of not, not feeling like asking for things was going to be like disruptive or problematic. And, you know, people, I think, really want to be helpful and supportive and so it's almost like hey this is what I need and it creates like an opportunity for them and that they are happy for it um so it's like bumping a desk up a little bit higher or um you know the department put in some like door openers that made things like a lot easier for me but sometimes it's like really exhausting and I don't know if you get around that um but uh yeah I sort of switched some of the, my focus like I did a lot more electronics after we became a wheelchair user because it was a little bit lighter and smaller and easier for me um so I wouldn't you know find like what really works for you and like I wouldn't hesitate to kind of experiment with that and I think that's going to be make up for a better experience thank you um, there's another question uh, that came in, which is on principle six. Um, so what does it look like to navigate 
knowledge from large scale research evidence versus a person slash small groups lived experience um, or expertise. Uh, and furthermore, how uh, do we navigate the heterogeneity within communities served by design as feedback is gathered? Yeah, so for large scale research evidence versus like small group lived experience, I really like to do like qualitative, which would be your small groups, and then follow that by quantitative, and then follow that by one by another round of qualitative, um, just to like verify like your findings. So you kind of you have some kind of hunch or hypothesis. You're working with a a group, and there, the team is like you know, creating something and then you get large scale feedback on it. And then you check back in and say, does this make sense? Like, um, and share those results. So that's what I like to do. Um, but I think sometimes you have to fight for like the resources to um, have two rounds of qualitative data. So just like kind of baking it into the plan. Um, is it's really good and that's for a short project if you have a longer project sometimes you can do more rounds and then that's that's great um and then the heterogeneity within communities served by design i think um we can all recognize that our networks are probably look a lot like we do like whoever we are our networks probably look a lot like us and so Making it intentional and saying, you know, I, it's important to me that my network be more diverse and finding ways that make sense for you where you can like meaningfully um, grow your network. I think that's really important. And then if you're talking about like um, getting feedback from communities, I mean, you can choose more diverse communities to get that feedback from sometimes it takes a little bit longer to maybe recruit. You might have to, um, I'm thinking about when we need community feedback for the parks, we realized that people with small children weren't able to participate as well. And we have park staff who run a summer camp and they're like certified to um, care for children. And we were like, oh, we could actually offer childcare for some of our meetings and that can bring in a more diverse group. So I think you can consider like the structure around how you're um, bringing people in for the feedback, how you're collaborating as well as like where and who you're like initially reaching out to. Um, I, you know, your, your response to that question sort of jogged something in my, my mind. And since you're an MBA student, um, I wonder if you can tell us sort of like, what, what does the business model for inclusion look like? You know, like, how do you, how, how, how does one convince a company that this is the right thing to do because it's right for people uh, when there's this pushback of finances and all that? So can you, can you just share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the first step is disaggregating your data. So a lot of times, especially for disability, but also some other um, kind of marginalized identities, we don't even ask the question, uh, do you have a disability? So we didn't even know at Ford, like did, you know, how many of our customers have disabilities? We didn't know. So I think that's the first step is being able to tease the data apart. And then you can more easily make the case and you can say like, hey, this impacts X percent of our existing customers. And we believe like we could grow market share by, you know, adding on to that, um, by creating a product that more people can use. And then the other kind of, I think, piece of the argument is you can always say there's spillover because oftentimes things that are designed to be usable for a wider group um, are better experience for everybody. And so one of the expressions is design for 
the edges, get the middle for free. I don't, I don't really like thinking about like people as on the edges, but really when we're marginalizing groups, it does mean kind of pushing people to the outskirts or disregarding them. And so, um, so I think that's kind of the basics of how you might start to build a business case, but I think it can be definitely really challenging because not everyone um, who you need approval from will have like the experiences or be able to kind of like empathize with the um, all of our customers that are in all these diverse groups. And so that kind of brings you back to like, what does our leadership team look like? Um, because sometimes it takes on me like, oh yeah, this really is a problem. And then all of a sudden it's like a door kind of opens. So it's definitely, definitely challenging, but start with being able to get some data and that'll really go a long way to building that out. Um, coming back to the, the Q&A questions. Um, so uh, do you have any advice on how to best gather community input in the design process? Do you have any lessons learned? Um, I think like plan, plan ahead for um, some things the community might need to be fully engaged. So if you're speaking to um, a like primarily Spanish speaking community, like it, either you need to speak Spanish or you need to like bring someone who speaks Spanish. Um, and it's great to like hire people from the community like that can help you chart the course. I think it's really important to always compensate um, people who are giving you their time, especially when it's a marginalized community. I hope everyone is paying um, people who are contributing to their projects at the minimum. And then you can see how if you apply some of those design justice principles, the relationship really goes beyond just like transactional. And so it's important to do things like share the tools, share the knowledge um, as well. So if you can kind of plan ahead for community needs and be sure to ask for things like, hey, what what else can help you engage? Do you need accommodations? Do you need a translator? Do you, what, how, we want to, you know, make this a really great experience. Um, and so like planning some budget for that kind of stuff for the maybe daycare um, is, is key. Um, and okay, so as the next question is um, sort of aside from the, uh, design justice principles that you presented today, how else might um, we become better allies for inclusive design, design justice, those kinds of concepts? Like how, how do we become better allies? Yeah, well, I think, you know, when you kind of start to, when you learn about um, like somebody else's needs they might be different from your own but you think like wow this like is maybe i can use um an example like um i was t telling my friend elizabeth that i was really struggling with this one door because the um the trash can, the, the facilities department kept putting this trash can in the spot where I needed to be to scan my badge. And she, um, that was just like a lunchtime conversation. But then she had a meeting with the vice president about something else. And she was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to bring this up. And she told him that like Emily has asked facilities multiple times to move this trash can and they won't do it. And then when the vice president told facilities, like you need to move this trash can, um, it never came back and it stayed, it stayed moved. So, um, I think, I, and that can be translated to, that was kind of my workplace experience, but it can be translated to products as well. So if you kind of like hear something like, um, someone mentions like a product is hard to use, or they can't find something that meets their needs. 
you can advocate for it. And when you see people bringing, you know, inclusive design business cases, or maybe not engaging with the community or not centering people um, who are going to be impacted by their project, you can always ask those questions and really kind of dig into it a little bit with them. So it's both like advocating and then kind of questioning and pushing back when you see things that are like not quite right. So I hope that it helps. There's like so many ways to be an ally, but oftentimes it's very context dependent. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Um, okay, so we'll do one more question. Um, what suggestions do you have for making safe space for students to share their challenges with diversity and inclusion? I don't know if this means maybe on a college campus or in the workplace, um, but just sort of talking generally about um, uh, cultivating a space where we can have those dialogues. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely like, uh, um, you can make sure that you kind of declare yourself to be like a safe person um, and like that you'll help people like resolve issues that they're facing. I think the with the LGBTQ um, plus community, there was um, a lot of people who put little pride flags in their offices or uh, on their desks to show like, hey, I'm a like a supportive resource for you. Um, the disability pride flag is like starting to become more popular. So that's like potentially something you can put a little bit of like some kind of like little sign or little note. Um, I think also just to create like a safe space, um, it really takes time to like build trust. So, um, if you can uh, advocate and ask, you know, hold talks like this and think and um, and I think students too, you can find each other. Like I know um, Ross has a um, student group for students with disabilities, and so like don't hesitate to also kind of self-form your own grassroots groups. I led our employee resource group at work. Um, we even have like a subgroup that's like a daily check-in where it's like no, um, no help offer, just support and just being there and kind of uh, listening. So I think it's a mix of, of kind of putting yourself out there and also don't hesitate to like form your own community, your own circle. Um, and if you're starting to hear like a lot of similar threads, you can always ask for a meeting um, with the like faculty and or with the administration who you think could be able to help solve that problem. Um, so, you know, use your voice, have confidence and um, find find those safe places or create them for yourself. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Um, we appreciate you taking the time uh, for you to, to join us today and to talk and to think about this important topic. Um, we, we are sending a survey to the audience to collect your feedback on today's lecture. Um, the survey has also been dropped in the chat as well. Our next DEI lecture will be January 24th featuring Angie Ferrehi who will be discussing best practices for equitable engagement with mental health concerns. An invitation will be forthcoming with more details. Um, so please watch your email for that. Uh, we hope to see you there. Um, thank you and have a great day and a great rest of your semester.